such a joy to be here with you this morning. So grateful. You know, I'm having a little fun with the title when I was asked to speak. And so I came up with how to use your a spiritual AAA card. Did you know you have one? Right. Yeah, our AAA card is great, right? And we know how to use them, right? Something happens with our car. We call the little number. We give them our number on the card. We show it to them and they fix it. Isn't that cool? But we have something similar. We have a divine birthright that we're born with, right? This card, so to speak, is our ability to activate the one mind that will help create conditions, open doors, and provide us with resources for whatever it is in our life we want to call in or that we want to heal. Isn't that great? That's the good news. It's always good to hear some good news these days, right? <laughs> And um, we're going to unpack that today. You know, Ernest Holmes says, there's a power for good and we can use it. We can use it. And it'd be great to know how to use it. So I'm going to talk about those three A's today that are the tools we can use and activate in our life to partner with the one mind. The A's are awareness, alignment, action. And I'm going to throw in a fourth bonus A which is acceptance, very important part of calling in our dreams or shifting conditions. And I have to confess, because we're in church, it's always good to confess when we're in church. <laughs> I've been working on this talk all week and I finished it last night and I did a round of practice and I went to bed and I'm like, this talk don't feel right. <laughs> I thought, oh no, it don't feel right because it wasn't in here. And I know when I'm not feeling it, you're not going to feel it. So what came in, my intuition was, you need to redo it. So I got up at six, <laughs> I didn't sleep very well, and I redid the talk. So it's my deep hope that the light of this message will shine into your hearts and that you'll feel it, that you'll get your own ahas in direction, uh, which is not even my message. It's the divine's message. Yes. And um, so I'm excited to bring this message to you this morning. A little tired, but excited. <laughs> so I'm going to unpack today's message through a very important event in my life. You know, sometimes we look back at our lives and we see that one little thing that happened that unfolded that made a big difference. Anybody? Just one little twist, one little turn in the road that led to something much bigger. And I want to share that with you today. In fact, this unfolding, if it hadn't happened, I don't think I'd be here with you. I really don't. And so I'm so grateful for it. And I want to kind of unpack it through the lens of these principles, uh, which is so very powerful. So in my 30s, uh, I was actually working for the city of Davis on a very special project regarding schools. And I learned about something called the education gap. Has anyone heard of that? educators studied, thank you, Karen, educators studied why students all getting the same education, some of them went to college and some of them didn't. And what they found out was the group that went to college, their parents were more likely to have went to college, like a high percentage of them. There was this correlation. And then that the students that didn't, usually their parents had only a high school education or maybe a little bit of college. But the smallest group to go to college, the 2%, was the group that not only did their parents not go to college, probably didn't graduate high school, and English was their second language, only 2% of those went to college. I was in the 2%. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Like, how did that happen? My mom, English was her second language. She was my primary parent. Oh, and the third factor, you were in the lower socioeconomic bracket, which is a nice way to say you're poor, okay? <laughs> and, that's, and that was our situation, right? That's, that, that, those were the conditions that I was in. But I didn't know I wasn't supposed to succeed. I didn't know anything about an education gap. But here's what I think made the difference, why I was in the 2%. Science of mind principles, my mother loved the science of mind. She believed in the science of mind. She lived it and she made me live it too. I didn't even know I was living it. You know, I come to her and say, mom, I need to get to the mall to sign up for soccer. And she go, there's a will, there's a way. You know, I'm 10 years old. So I'm getting on my bike, pedaling for five miles. Like, I didn't know. I didn't know. 
you know, I'd come to her with a problem. Well, mind over matter. I, okay, what do I do with that? Like I didn't, I couldn't understand this, but I just knew that something within me, there was something within me that I could use to affect my situation. And she made me live by that. In fact, I could say the F word and get in trouble, but if I said I can't, oh my God, she would lose herself. She'd go, there is no can't. And she'd shake her head and her hand would fly up. I couldn't even use, I knew I couldn't use that word. And so I was just swimming around in these principles. The, the, the messages of the world had a hard time getting in because that was the belief system I was raised in. And so this key event had to do with athletics. It had to do with me becoming a softball pitcher that led me through my academic pursuits. Let's just be honest. I went to school to play sports. I'm gonna be honest, we're in church, <laughs> I'll tell the truth. But here's the deal. Me becoming a pitcher was just as unlikely as me going to school. I didn't have the resources. I didn't have people in my family coaching me. I didn't have anyone stepping up to, to take the team, right? I just knew I had a dream. And this is when I first discovered this dream. I remember it, I was eight years old, hands on my knees, way out in left field, wearing one of those two big hats that came down to here. <laughs> anyone seen that picture before? And if you know anything about eight-year-old baseball games, softball games, the ball don't come to the outfield <laughs> and I'm out there. And I saw this person in the middle of the field who always got the ball. And I thought, I wanna be that person. And I found out that person is called the pitcher. And as soon as I found out that's the pitcher, something inside me said, oh, that's what I am. Now there was nothing in my environment to say I was that, nothing just an internal knowing that's who I was. Now, I didn't get to complete the season that year and I moved away from Monterey and then I came back. And when I came back, I was 12 years old and the only sport going was softball. And I came just in time in the spring to get into late registration. See, lining me back up to get back involved. And I got the last jersey, number 13. Yeah, I was bad luck for the other team. That's what I would say. <laughs> and here's the deal. All of my teammates had been growing in their skills and I hadn't. I couldn't catch. I couldn't throw. I couldn't hit. I played left, left out. I was on the bench. It was terrible. And I went home and I complained to my mom that, you know, I felt left out and nobody paid attention to me and I didn't like it and it was hard. So she just turned to me and said, why don't you quit? I thought, that's just the craziest idea. I thought, I can't quit. I said, one time I didn't get in trouble for saying can't, by the way. I said, I can't quit because I had a dream. I had an awareness. I had a clarity of who I was. And I would ask people, how do you get to pitch? How do you get an opportunity? And they would say, well, only the kid or the coach gets to pitch. They'd say that. But it didn't stop me. You know what I did after games? I would come home. I'd get out a cardboard box. I would find a few softballs. I'd pitch them. I'd go pick them up and I'd do it again. And I'd imagine the batters, strike, ball, strike, right? I would play it all out in my mind, just knowing that that's who I was and I was getting ready. Now, the next year, I got put on a team as the catcher, close, but still not close enough. But here's what happened. The next season after that, I happened to land on a team who the uncle was coaching and his relative, the kid didn't want to pitch. So he comes out and says, who are the pitchers here? I shot my hand right up. Now, I'd never pitched. I'd never been in a game. There were six of us with hands up. I'm like, oh, here's my opportunity. Now, as soon as I did that, I went, oh, no. What if I don't get it across the plate, right? So I got to try out and I became one of three pitchers that season. And it began a very powerful journey. Now, none of that I could make happen, but I was making it welcome through my awareness, through my clarity, through my visualization. Now, the next year I was on the freshman team and I was working out, I was getting prepared. I was so excited, I was running bleachers and my basketball coach 
happened to see me running bleachers. He knew I was serious about being a pitcher. So he found, I was in a little town, nobody knew how to coach this. He found a clinic in San Jose, which is like an hour and a half away. He signed me up because he knew we didn't have money. He took me because he knew I didn't have transportation, even fed me. And the guy teaching the clinic was one of the best pitchers in the world, Rick Ballswick. I learned rise balls, drop balls, change ups, knuckles. When I came in, I couldn't even, I couldn't practice enough. I was on fire. It was this amazing space of inspiration and it just took off. I landed on all-star teams and yes, I got a scholarship to college. It was the carrot that kept me in school. I had to show up. And not only did becoming a pitcher and, and helping it get me through school, but it taught me things, resilience, self-control, teamwork. And it brought me down the road of all that was to come in my life. Now, what I didn't know then is I was using science of mind principles, what I'm calling today our spiritual AAA card. I was activating the law of mind. Now, I want to be clear. I didn't make this happen. I got in alignment with a power that partnered with me and created the resources, the opportunities, and the open door, right? Ernest Holmes says that we do not create, we use the power of mind that creates for us, right? Just like electricity. If we need light on in the house, we don't go, I need to go create some electricity. No, we just got to find the light switch. We just got to know how to use it, how to partner with it, right? Um, so that's what we're gonna talk about now, those three and bonus four A's. So the first A is awareness. What belief system are you thinking with? Your conscious mind, which one are you using? Are you using the thinking and belief system of the world, which is limited, condition-based? Or are you using the belief system of the spiritual truth, unlimited possibilities and resources that exist for you, through you, and around you. You know, I wasn't the coach's kid. I didn't let that stop me. I didn't let that thinking of the world in. I stayed in possibility thinking. Now you might be asking Mitch, how do I know if I'm caught up in the world's BS belief system? How do I know? I invite you to check in with yourself and see what story are you telling yourself? Are you not able to do something because of condition out there, right? That's limitation thinking. And that's how we're taught to think. You got to have the money to start a business, right? You, you've got to um, go to school to, to do, to teach something, right? Whatever it is. You know, I'm not even a full-fledged minister yet and I'm speaking, right? It's possibility thinking that gets us there. So if we're, if we're looking at conditions or permissions from the world or its standards, you're in the belief system of the world. If you hear any of the twos in your head or come out of your mouth, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too fat, I'm too poor, I'm too broke, I'm any of those twos, you're in the world's BS. And you need to make the shift to the capital T truth, that belief system of spirit that's based on the only real truth there is beyond the facts, beyond the percentages, beyond the figures, beyond the 2% is the spiritual high truth. And how do you know when you're in that belief system? Well, you're telling yourself empowering stories. Even though I'm not the, the kids, the, the coach's kid, I know there's a way, right? Engaging in possibility thinking. You know, I love the quote in Alice in Wonderland where the queen is talking to Alice and she says, well, I believe six impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> that would be so metaphysical. I just love that, right? Six, imagine if we all did that. I'm just gonna believe six impossible things before I even eat in the morning. And what is this all about? Well, it's about the thought force that we start to activate and put into motion in the one mind. And I want to speak uh, a, little, a few words from the science of mind about thought force, right? Because that's really what we're doing. 
when we're engaging in this belief system. So Ernest Holmes says, thought force is a movement of consciousness in a field of mechanical but intelligent law. The movement of consciousness upon itself creates a motion or a vibration upon substance, the force of which is equal to the embodiment of the thought set in motion. The force of which is equal to the embodiment, to the degree we embody that thought, right? It's just like, remember vinyl records and your needle got stuck and it would just create that groove, right? In the vinyl and you try to play the record and as soon as it got that groove, that's where it was. It would stay there. That's how we condition our mind to create that attractive force, that groove of energy to bring to us what it is we're thinking about, what it is we believe. The other part of awareness is clarity, clarity. Has anyone ever had clarity so deep you just felt it in your body? Anybody? Just felt it, it was visceral and it was instant and there was nothing in your conscious mind that could disagree with this truth, with this vision that you had. That's what I had as a pitcher. That's what I had as a minister. And now I've had clarity that I'm an author. So now I'm got to hold myself on that hook, right? I got to get my card out, right? So I'm making you all, oh, you can put me on the hook for this one. I got to get my card out. So clarity, it moves providence, even when the conditions haven't unfolded yet. And then that magnetizes us to the resources, to the open doors, to the how, okay? Standing on capital T truth with our clarity. The second part here is A number two, alignment. Stay in alignment. Once you have clarity, now your work is to stay in alignment with what you know to be the truth of you, your mission, your purpose, what needs to be healed, whatever it is. And the most powerful tool I know for this is your imagination. Work in the workshop of the imagination. You know, every night, as I fell asleep, I would visualize myself in the pitching circle and I would count balls and strikes and I would see myself winning the game. And then later I saw myself getting into college and then I saw myself graduating, right? All of this visual, it just happened naturally. I just somehow knew to do it. It felt good. So there are tools for us to do visualization. You know, Mary Morrissey, love her. Um, she has a great tool where you show up as your future self to someone. And you, and you talk about when they say, how are you? You go, oh, I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm a successful author and spiritual teacher. Like you just marinate in that with someone else affirming it and congratulating you. You know, if you have somebody in your life you can do that with, it's a great exercise. Uh, Mae McCarthy has a great journaling exercise where you give thanks for your future self in present time and you're writing this down and you're talking about what you're doing today as your future self. Uh, that particular tool is in her path, the wealth book. Very powerful. Um, and also that sleep time just before we fall asleep. The other thing that helps us stay in alignment is paying attention to how we feel or our emotional compass, our emotional compass. And that compass, when we're, when we're engaging in, in thoughts of what we want to call in, it should feel expansive. It should feel joyful. It should feel abundant. It should feel peaceful. It should feel easy. If it feels like anything else, you might be out of alignment. You know, we, we know when our car is out of alignment, right? And we go to drive somewhere, it just kind of pulls us to off our course. That's what's happening with our feeling self. So it's really important we honor those feelings. Don't bypass them. Check in. Face it. Why am I feeling tentative here? Why am I feeling a sense of fear or dread, right? Because sometimes in our subconscious, we may not think we're worthy of this good. Who am I? Who am I to go speak and not be a minister yet, right? I've had that. I've had that feeling. I've had to say, I'm, I'm a piece of God, right? I'm a channel for the divine and so is everybody else, right? Or fear. Who am I to shine so brightly, right? So you might be caught up in the world's BS, belief system. You know, there's a lot of people who've done the shoulds, you know? A lot of lawyers and doctors who didn't want to be lawyers and doctors. A lot of people who married lawyers and doctors because they were told to, right? This script for good or success, you might be caught up in that. 
And that might be pulling you away from your intention. So alignment. Alignment is so important. It's probably the most powerful thing you do after clarity. Do not allow limitation thinking to enter. You know, when my mom said, just quit, I said, no, immediately. I didn't even think about it. I rebuked that quitting, not even on the table. See, that level of thought force and embodiment is what's required to really pull in that quality of resources. You know, because there's no shortage of people who are going to tell you how it is, right? Or to get real or to be more realistic. And I would love to share just a quick little video with you from Steve Harvey. I don't know if you've heard his story, but it's a beautiful story. And, um, oh, hold on, let me go back. Got to make sure you can hear my volume here. Um, about his journey and his dream that he had uh, growing up. Make sure you can hear my sound here. Okay, so. Here we go. Well, I'm sorry, it's not gonna come up, <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you what happened. How about that? So Steve Harvey, as he was in grade school and um, the teacher had an assignment. He wanted the teacher, she wanted everyone to write out what it is you wanna be when you grow up. Now, here's what you need to know about Steve Harvey. He had a terrible stuttering problem, really bad. And he wrote down, I wanna be on TV. That's what he wrote. That's what he wanted. And that night, the teacher shows up to his house and talks to his father, complaining that Steve's being a smart aleck, that he's cutting up in school, that he, when she gave him this assignment, he said he wanted to be on TV, like making fun of my assignment, right? And the father's like, well, what's wrong with wanting to be on TV? Like, is that a problem? And, and she's like, oh, he didn't mean it. Oh, he's just trying to be funny, right? She. She was just shouting him down in her mind. Obviously he had a stuttering problem. How could he ever want to be on TV, right? Judging him, a child. So Steve was up in his room because he was sent to his room. He's expecting he's going to get a whooping because he's in trouble at school. Father comes up. He says, uh, what's going on with this paper? What did they want you to write? And Steve, Steve said, well, probably that I want to be a basketball player or something. And the father said, well, you're going to write that paper and you're going to turn it in to the teacher. He said, but the, the first one you wrote, you're going to keep it in your drawer. And every morning you're going to read it when you wake up. And every night before you go to bed, you're going to read it again. Since his father was wise, he knew that people weren't always going to see us in as our, our dreams as possible. And if you know anything about Steve Harvey, he's on TV. He does the family feud. He's had his own show dynamic speaker, powerful motivational speaker. See, he didn't let it in. People are not always going to understand your dreams, your intention, your vision for yourself. Amen? Yes. All right, let's get to the third A, action. Action. Notice I said, you don't, you need to create a plan. You need to have it all figured out. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I said action. What did I do? I got a cardboard box. I had a few softballs. I began where I was at with what I have. That's all you need. And what's your cardboard box? What does that look like for you? Do you want to start a nonprofit around a cause that's in your heart? Get with a few people online, meet up, start an action. You don't need to have it all figured out. The one mind creates that path, that how. 
Or maybe you want to find love. Go find a, a dating app. Open it up. Sign up. See what happens. Start one little action. Maybe you want to go back to school. You're like, oh, I don't have the money. Maybe I don't have the time. Meet with a counselor. Start where you're at and begin. It has magic in it. It has power in it. And you are partnering at that moment with an energy, with a wisdom that is in all places and spaces. You know, when I took action, I was running those bleachers. All of a sudden it led to a, a workshop to learn, to grow, to assist me on my path. So many times we stop at the door of action thinking I can't do it because I don't know how or I don't have the resources. Has anyone ever experienced that? I have, I still do, right? I gotta be reminded of these things. You know, I love this quote from Henry David Thoreau, an American philosopher back in the 1800s. He says, if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life that he has imagined, he will be met with success unexpected in common hours, unexpected. So beautiful. I got on the right team. I got some help with the workshop. I got a scholarship. I didn't make any of that happen. Spirit, one mind, God did. I just showed up with my consciousness and my actions. Blessed be. So here's the fourth A, the sneaky A is what I call it, because you know, action, alignment, awareness, those, those are kind of things we know when we're in this gig for a while, right? But here's the fourth one, and the one that we need to pay attention to, and that is acceptance. Are you receptive to receive this good, this healing, right, this promotion, this love in your life, whatever it is, this abundance, this money, whatever it is. Because here's what happens. When our life up levels, I love this, I've heard this quote before. When you up level, there's always another devil, right? The mind wants to tap us back down into the old way of being, right? And here's what comes up. And it came up for me the minute I raised my hand and said I was a pitcher. All of a sudden I thought, well, am I enough to do this? I mean, nobody's taught me, right? Am I really worthy of being a pitcher, like being the leader? You know, I had imposter syndrome for the longest time. For, for over a year, I still didn't believe I was a pitcher. Or am I willing to be a different version of myself? See, we get nervous. This messes with our receptivity. Have you ever met someone? They were offered an incredible opportunity and they turned it down. They turned it down because fear was running the show, right? And here's what's going on. Here's what I think is going on, is there's a, there's a dialogue within ourselves. Can we meet the demands of this new way of being? You know I, know, I know of some people who pray for wholeness of health, but I can sense there's a part of them that's afraid to be fully healed in mind and body because more is gonna be expected. More is gonna be expected. Can't count on the headache or the migraine anymore, right? It's, it's that kind of thing. I've caught myself doing that. I had diverticulitis. I finally healed it. But more is expected. And that's a good thing. Managing more money. More money comes in. What am I going to do with all this money? It makes some people nervous. Right? Lottery winners get rid of it in a year because they're not receptive. They're not, they haven't cultivated the acceptance of this new level of abundance. Right? Or people, I love this when people get promoted, like a lot of times people turn down promotions because more will be expected of you. You know, you were in the group with all the other staff complaining about management and what they should do. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're getting the opportunity to promote. You're going to have to fix that. You're going to have to fix it. Right? And people are like, oh, no, not me, not me. Right? Here's what I want everyone to remember. And I need to remember this. Your enoughness does not come from you from the small I personal self you. What makes you enough for anything is the divine spirit, the higher power, the one mind, the one love, the one wisdom. It's beating your heart. It's growing your hair. It's breathing you. You don't do those things. 
It's coordinating all trillions of cells working together. That kind of power is what makes you enough. Amen? Amen. Amen. <sighs> you know, I believe that we have a spiritual duty to shine, to be the best version of ourselves. We owe it to each other. You ever been around a person who's, who's really shining, who's really on that path to their higher self? You wanna be around them. They're like a little light, right? Their energy is magnetic. And we owe it to each other to do this because there's only one. We're all cells in a body called humanity. Imagine if your liver cell is like, eh, I don't want to operate that good. I don't want to be too big. I don't want to be too healthy. It affects the whole body. It affects the whole body. So as I wrap this up, let us remember to be in the awareness that is the thought force that is co-creative with us, right? the thinking of spirit, the belief system and thinking of spirit. And let's stay in alignment with our vision, right? Using that workshop of the imagination, let's take action. Begin where you are with what you have. It is powerful. In fact, you forget all the A's, don't forget action. It's the one that will keep you moving where you need to go. And then the last one is acceptance. It is the pleasure of the divine to give you every good of your heart. That clarity is there for a reason. It's the purpose, the pull of the divine asking to be expressed through you. And it is fully supported, fully. So I want to wrap up today's talk with a little bit of wisdom from Marianne Williamson. You may have heard this bit of wisdom before, but I think it's worth repeating. And it's called our deepest fear. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your plain small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people don't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And let us shine our own light. We unconsciously give other people the permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us take this message into prayer. Ah, I am knowing that each of us, is held in the heart and the wisdom of the divine and is being called to be of service in this world, the light, the love, the grace, the healing, the compassion, the creativity of the divine into the world for the one of us. And I speak my word now knowing that each and every person is equipped with all that they need to begin and to partner with this powerful creative force that opens every right door and shuts every wrong door, that brings every resource, every inspiration, every amount of direction and how is fully provided right now. And so I give thanks for speaking this word. I give thanks for knowing the high truth that God, that good is all there is and we are each a piece of it always divinely supported, directed, protected, uplifted. Ah, I release this word into the perfect activity of love and law. I let it go, I let it be. And together let us declare, and so it is. Mm -hmm.